Cuba, Cuba is the largest island in the Antilles and comprises half of the land mass of the Caribbean islands. Like many places in the Caribbean, it keeps a Taino name to this day. Cuba means well-planted land. The name was noted by Columbus early in his first voyage. I like to tell all Cubans when you say I am Cubano, you're speaking Taino. This is likely the earliest emblem <coughs> for the island. The Spanish changed its name twice, first to Juana and then to Fernandina by royal edict. Neither took. Cuba, it remained. In my study lens, this attachment to the Indian name already evidences a telling measure of indigeneity. Here we see the Caribbean islands in their indigenous names. A lot of Caribbean toponymy remains in Taino words. 25 to 30 percent of Cuban place names are from Taino language base, with estimates of 400 to 1,000, some, some estimate more, Taino language words embedded in the Spanish of the Greater Antilles. This is also a good general clue of indigeneity for Cuba and much of the Caribbean region. Linguists estimate, and the archaeology tends to confirm, that the period of Indian-based culture and society had to last much past the estimated period of Indian extinction, which has been prescribed between 1550 and 1600. The reality of a much longer period of cultural incubation, a transculturation, as coined by Cuban scholar Fernando Ortiz, I, I propose, significantly weaves in much indigenous culture, not the cacicasco or chieftainship system of classic times, but in the daily life of the people of Cotidiana. I present today then an overview of some salient elements of indigeneity found in Cuba, focusing on the eastern region, starting among Guajiros in the savannas or plains area of Camaway. You see Camaway there, uh, a bit uh, toward, the, uh, toward the east, a uh, large uh, province. And then I go uh, further east in my talk to the remote Sao Baracoa Mountains of Guantanamo province. In this quest of Taino trails, my preferred field of investigation has been with in situ or place-based agricultural communities, multi-generational homesteads. I have personal history in this region, as my people are from Kamaway and they are Wahiro, still descendants of the horse-riding cattle people from the culture of the mountain. The mountain. I have found or confirmed a good measure of indigeneity in Kamaway among Wahiro people, both in material and what they call intangible culture. Farther east into the mountains in the remote valley places known as Calidad de los Indios and La Escondida de Indios in the region of Guantanamo, we further find a very particular Cuban population spread out in mountain homesteads and even in city barrios. And I refer specifically to a clan of people, the Rojas Ramirez families and the recognized cacique Panchito Ramirez Rojas. A bit more on this later. To define indigeneity in my own way, indigeneity has many definitions, and so many that it remains a slippery term. The core of it in the Americas, in my methodology, is to be found again in those elements of human culture that sustain and form and or substance knowledge and life ways of indigenous peoples and cultures. Indigeneity in this context is an inherited both biological and cultural. I look for this particularly in the land human nexus, the culture of useful saberes or place-based knowledge. Los Guajiros. This particular painting by Eduardo Avera, Los Guajiros Cubanos, from 1934, is a classic of the Cuban art tradition. As one can see, it evidences the reality of the biological and cultural mestizo and Cuban archetype called Wahiro. A limited but establishes history establishes the origin of the Wahiro in Cuban indigeneity. The Camagüey region in particular boasts a strong and lengthy early mestizaje, initially between Indian and Spanish, and later also between African, Indian, and Spanish. The etymology of the term Wahiro roots it in the Taino language, while the values ascribed to Wahiros mark them as the most natural of Cubans. 
The Wajiro are noted for their independence, their natural life ways, and place-based knowledge interwoven in indigeneity. In Camagüey starts what is known as the Cuban interior, the interior. As one travels away from Havana through the length of the island, one still journeys culturally and geographically, geographically away from the cosmopolis to the Monte, Monte Adentro, what Dr. Peter Helm has called Cuba's Wild East. Here are some of my guajillos from the old Camagüey. This is my great-grandfather, Joaquin Cabrera, his daughter, Josefa Cabrera. Here's my grand old teacher during childhood, Don Joseito Veloz, and you'll see him with me here in 1955. Next. He was my mentor in early childhood. I bought a lot of beans and pulled up many stacks of yuca with this old man, and I heard a lot of stories. My investigation of our Caribbean indigeneity is obviously in good measure guided by my early experiences with this Wahilo realm. Next. Next. The descendants of my Cabrera clan relatives are still there, already over half a century after my own migration. Half a century. And the centuries kind of go on pretty fast. Not, uh, it don't take that long, 500 years. This is uh, one family and rancho today, typical of the many country dwellings in Camagüey. These grassroots mestizo folk hold many saberes of place-based knowledge. They also, they also uphold a continuing fabulosity, what I call the morality of enchantment. Camagüey with your families still provide a rich ground for research and healing practices and mythologies in the popular imagination. It bears noting not many people know this is a recent study, that the most recent island-wide genetic study marks 33% Caribbean indigenous mitochondrial DNA nationally for all Cubans. I believe uh, it's the similar study in Puerto Rico is 61%. And I think if we do uh, the eastern half of Cuba, we're going to find that up again. There are many, uh, there are hospitable people. When a long lost uh, cousin like myself shows up, the custom is always to butcher a pig and throw a feast. A number of old time traditions of high indigeneity persist to this day among Guajiros, mythological, medicinal, agricultural. Cahuelo, the Taino term. This is a shape shift or changeling. The old Guajiros still talk about such people. Many stories about the shape shifters in the Camagüey region. The Hiwe, which I don't have illustrated, but it's the, these are the little people. Many stories associated with ponds and rivers will have a particular Hiwe identified uh, with, with those uh, sources of water. Uh, this indigenous fabulosity actually is quite widespread. Cuban folklorists, including the great uh, Samuel Fejo, identified it as the, the most rooted of all Cuban indigenous traditions. Another ancient tradition is the attention to faces of the moon in planting and cropping practices, particularly the old Taino tuber crops, yuca, yame, boniato, of course, the corn and beans uh, uh, complex, peppers. These crops all have their particular moon faces for planting, which is also used to guide the cutting of various species of trees and bushes. This is a practice documented early in the Chronicles by Fernandez de Villa. A most important ceremonial complex is the cura de trato. We spoke a little bit about that this morning. Uh, they call the trapping cure, which often invokes the healing power of specific trees. It involves a sobalo, which you see here, a traditional massage practice widespread in Latin America, very strongly arguably of indigenous origin. The Cura del Rastro is consulted by many people for curing children, animals, and even crops. Uh, here, Don Barongo, a relative of mine, responds to a young woman who stopped by as I was visiting to request a ceremony for an early pregnancy. You can note the bottle which holds what he calls moon water. This is the water that's collected in the first rain of spring, the first rain of May, the primera agua de mayo. And then they put it out to the moon overnight to collect the moon's power. The Curacao Corrastro ceremony is but one version of 
this widespread and largely unstudied tradition found in specific sectors throughout eastern Cuba. Here is another rastrejo, the tracker, from the old Indian town of El Cane, next, Don Pedro Mangana. Mangana works his ceremony, these are photos from uh, last year, 2012, on uh, here on a young asthma sufferer, and uh, he works with the power of this armasigo tree, which he saw in a vision as a young man when he began his practice 70 years before this photograph. And it's uh, amazing as we were interviewing Mangana, the number of people in that neighborhood, which is in El Cane, one of the early Indian towns of Cuba. Still not, no longer in an Indian jurisdiction, but with many uh, families still living there, <coughs> him uh, being one of them. Uh, many, uh, probably some 30 people came out to give us testimonies of the curing powers of this uh, track and cure of the Mangana. Uh, in Camagüey, as one travels east again, the presence of indigeneity in material culture appears with more regularity, so much so that most Cubans hardly notice how much of their daily ambience roots in indigeneity. Two key recurring themes, very common here and still present in other parts of the Caribbean, <coughs> the boil, the thatch roof, palm, thatch, uh, wood, and uh, uh, roof, and uh, the uh, many waves as you travel through the island. Uh, next. And uh, again, next. And the Kasai, uh, which you see again with some regularity. Again, it is one, the Kasai is the uh, tort bred from the yucca plant, uh, a Taino tradition that remains today quite strong. <coughs> again, it is one thing to see the finished product in a store or to drive past the boil, but what is most appreciable is the complex of knowledge and skills that it takes to construct a boil or to produce cassava. Both have ceremonial context where a boil is inaugurated, in the mountains especially, in many places the four directions at the four corners of the structure are blessed by the main local elder using water. Here you see again, boil produced in a semi-industrial capacity wrapped in the old uh, Taino Catalo, the palm frond uh, vessel. So going east, uh, uh, in Gamma Way, uh, a range of uh, indigeneity in daily life is protectable. But a tribal or kinship linkage that groups people is not as palpable. For that one has to go farther east to the mountains. Uh, there are a child that I heard this rejoin their lot and come away. If you really want to know the deeper, the story, you want to meet the, the full blood Indians, that, like they used to say, or if uh, you want to see more of our culture, you have to go east to the mountains. That what we do here comes from those mountains. And there's some historical evidence that a lot of uh, knowledge from the mountains travels through the island during the um, campaign of the great general Antonio Maceo during the War of Independence in 1895 that took a lot of that knowledge with his troops uh, across the island. It was in 1995, next, I had the opportunity to go east into those mountains to a fascinating community of unusually strong cultural and kinship cohesion. Here you see my first vision really of the unique and well loved cacique or chief of La Caridad de los Indios coming in by horseback from his yucca field in a pouring tropical rain. One short lecture cannot do justice to the revealing nature of the work with and our understanding of the Caridad de los Indios community and their extended network of kinship circles. The Caridad de los Indios and La Rancheria, we find the core families of a kinship community in the region, a tribe, I like to say, or gems, not counted in their own family count or census at over 1,800 people, probably near, nearing 2,000. I have suggested the term clan or gens in a Hindi to recognize their tribal character as indigenous people. This kinship people can point to a history of belonging in the mountains, how they got their names by mass baptism in the early colonial times, Rojas and Ramirez, Rojas the Conquistador, Ramirez the Bishop, of Santiago at that time, 
1530s. Uh, at the time when they began mass baptisms, so a large number of people got the last name Rojas, and another large number of people got the last name Ramirez, and they have intermarried ever since as they were a, a people, a kinship people before that. I have, uh, this kinship people can point into a history of belonging in the mountains. Uh, again, I like to call them a kinship nation, and they, keep, they claim also a substantial documentary history of recognition and dissolution, relocation and continuity since early in the colonial period. In fact, they have pointed the way via their oral tradition to the discovery of documentary evidence that revises a piece of Cuban history. I refer to the Atue Regiment, which his people, Machito Ramirez and his, uh, his grandparents and his grandfathers fought in a regiment organized under Antonio Maceo 99.9% .9 of Cubans don't know this. They will know everything about Antonio Maceo, but there was actually an Indian regiment called the Atue Regiment that organized in that war and fought engagements right through that war. A major piece of our history is completely forgotten because we have been taught to believe that Taino was not existing. Next, here Panchito showing his Here's Pachito proudly showing his Indio tabaco, original germ plasm, earliest germ plasm the Cuban people, the, the tobacco industry in Cuba, which is quite extensive, has sent scientists up there to gather some of this uh, seed bank materials that they still hold. Their yuca is original, their corn is original, very different from other varieties, uh, their uh, boniato, all the tuber crops of all time uh, belong to them. The Indian tobacco, original germplasm, is uh, the base of Panchito's ceremonial complex, the most important ceremonial complex he has, La Oración del Tabaco, the tobacco prayer. Next. Here, uh, Reina Rojas, who is uh, Ramira, Panchito's wife, and who is also a major, uh, what they call a head woman, elder of the community. Next. Go. Back. Back. Not forward. No, they're wrong here. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, in any case, uh, we see Reina. We see another uh, woman named Reina, who's also a, a major person in the community. Uh, Reina Mom. We see Elder Obulio uh, with knees and Panchito. All Obulio was a master. He passed away two years ago, but he was a master of the moon planting system, much oral history and tradition. The tradition of planting by moon faces is documented among Taino, the early chronicler Fernandez de Villa. It is very involved and in a scientific context connects with natural phenomena, soil humidity, insect migrations associated with the moon. So that you have to plant a certain moon, you have to cut your wood in certain moons. If you cut the wood in a full moon, your boil will rot within a year. If you cut it in a waiting moon, that boil will last 100 years. And that's not people know. I had a clip to hear of moon climbing by a boom, but I'm going a little slow, so I'm going to uh, skip through the visual, uh, the uh, video materials. Some of the other presentations have excellent uh, video materials. Pachito and Reina making tobacco offerings, reminiscing of early depictions of Columbus' first encounters with the wonder plant. We have fully documented this tradition, which has its own music and prayers of appreciation for the cosmic family and other essential elements that support human life, express connection to Mother Earth. This oration intones an aviso, or a, a signal, to the creation, with the tobacco smoke and offered to transmit the message of thanksgiving. It recognizes and appreciates seven powers, los siete poderes, four directions, the squaring off into the four directions as you make your prayer, appreciating that the four directions really means the cosmos, Within that cosmos, the Mother Earth, the Father Sun, the Mother Moon, sometimes Grandmother Moon, the stars, the air, and the water. Very similar, actually, for me, it was quite a surprise to hear this the first time. Very similar to the Iroquois Thanksgiving Address, which is much more complex, but has precisely the same structure. 
It is uh, a company uh, by chance in Spanish, uh, one to the moon and one to the sun. Yo trabajo con la luna, yo trabajo con el sol, sol y luna, préstame tu resplandor. That's part of the song. Uh, the songs are in Spanish, largely, the Indian talking. Drum in Cuba is largely African drum and uh, other music, of course, from Spain. But that toque of the drum only is found out there. <coughs> At La Rancheria, Ranchito Sport Community, in, in this uh, in particular sector of Caridad Los Indios, uh, in that particular four group of about 60 people, 12 families, sustain a very high level of food self sufficiency based on the old Conuco or Taino agriculture. Conuco here is not simply how it's uh, interpreted in other places, a planted field. The conuco is a planted field. Here he refers, Machito and his folks, to the interplanting and continuously rotating system of the Taino tubers, always accompanied by the corn and beans complex, other vegetables. They call it the conuco, the store in the mountains, La Tienda en la Montaña because it never fails to give you, you go, you take a yuca, you plant the yuca. And like that, that same panuku, and it's fertilized as well, it's always there. Muchacho, go get a boniato. That's dinner. <coughs> a strong attention, again, is paid to their ancestor, oh, I'm sorry. The form of the panuku in additional crops, has evolved to include European and African and other foods, plantain, malanga, chickens and pigs. Again, form and substance. The substance, the indigeneity principle of self-sufficiency and thus an in-place independence, food self-sufficiency, food sovereignty, sustains. So I look for those, the indigenous principle. If we get stuck in the form, we say it's all over. But if you look at the actual principle under the form, we see the continuity. I had another clip here, one from one, but I don't want to pass it. Doña Reina Mongo, next here, uh, uh, they're looking at the um, strong attention that they have to their ancestral knowledge about herbal healing through teas, conferences, infusions, smudging. The tradition contains a high dosage of spiritual reciprocity with nature for the use of its plant medicine. This is, uh, again, the indigenous American practice, requesting permission as you gather the plant medicine, asking for the healing power of the plant with the obligation of giving back. Tobacco, sometimes a penny, but there is a sense of reciprocity. Herbs all around the home. Here they're picking, uh, I think it's tobacco seeds, uh, which they use in certain medicines, again, or in the picking of other herbs. <coughs> Next. Doña, Doña Reina Mongo, a senior healer from La Rancheria, is also a respected sobalora. In her practice, this is the, uh, the healing massage practice, she did not conduct the full trap and cure ceremony I referred to earlier because it was not her dome or her gift, as she explains. She works at the massage and the herbal site of healings, always with the idea and the uh, sense of respect for the ancestors that channeled through her uh, in doing this work. This is uh, uh, her work as a, as a healing sumo Self-identity is also a constant. Everything behind him is 
uh, medicinal extracts. There is not one synthetic piece of medicine in that whole plant. Interesting here, 100 years uh, after the conquest of Cuba, the primary physician for Santiago de Cuba, restricted by law from leaving the jurisdiction of Santiago in 1609, is a Taino curandera. She had uh, authority over the Spanish doctors. Not something on the way to extension. Uh, I was speaking here, I think what I missed here is, is the assertion of, uh, of identity. Uh, again, uh, we saw Panchito and the women here, the elder women. This is a repatriation of uh, human remains by the Smithsonian in recognition of their relation to these Taino remains. Our museum is committed to uh, repatriating all human remains in our collection. I think we've achieved most of it. Mm -hmm. We have maybe bit minor material that's not perhaps identifiable to the culture, but everything else uh, as part of that new museology of respect has gone back. And here, interestingly, uh, and it took a lot of doing given the geopolitical situation between Cuba and the United States, we actually were able to take these human remains for Pachito and his uh, other elders to be buried in Cuba. So it points to that willingness to self-identify, which is one of the um, elements uh, in looking for the indigeneity of a people, versus the self-identification. Uh, and for the Roas Ramirez clan to be Indian, to say Indian, is comprehensive. So the first reading, as we arrived at the place for the first time, this was the primary message. These got turned around somehow. Keep going. Well, this is self-identifying uh, in terms of coming out of their community to tell the world that they, that they have the authority to bury those relatives. Here, as part of my work with Pachito in, uh, in uh, uh, interviewing the orality, uh, we worked with him, and he was willing to put down a great deal of his orality in the book that we published in Cuba. Next. Uh, Pachito Cacique de Montaña. Again, the assertion, the willingness to come forward now after so many years of quiet living and quiet remembrance to come forward into society and assert who they are. This is uh, not an easy situation in a country like Cuba where uh, the sense of identity and ideology is very articulated. Here a little bit of the methodology. Uh, once all the uh, Interviews are transcribed. Uh, a local teacher, uh, Chicha Latin, the two elders, the daughter who is literate, the two elders are uh, pre literate, I don't want to say illiterate, but pre literate, uh, and uh, going over phrase by phrase, word by word, everything that was transcribed so that he would have the opportunity to approve it or disapprove. It. And then finally, out of that comes the book. In determining the indigeneity of a people, one notes again first self identification and assertion, uh, in this case of Cuba Indian identity. Two, external identification, how we others view them, what is the documentary history. And three, the, for me at least, the ecosystemic connective knowledge, particularly culture in place, how much of that knowledge still survives. And indigeneity is very much of place long roots in place. These three contexts are all very rich in the Rojas Ramirez clan families, in testimonies and in the deep, <clears throat> and uh, mostly ignored uh, history uh, of documentation of, uh, of their uh, uh, area. No, I'm sorry, I'm not. Well, again, there's a uh, substantial and consistent external documentary evidence for the indigenous or Indian identity in this region. Unlike other places in the Caribbean where such documentary history is difficult to come by, the record has been mostly ignored, often dismissed, often ridiculed. But the historical record for this particular population is very strong, and also for several other identifiable 
Indio descendant populations, some of which are coming forward increasingly in towns like Baracoa, Iguani, Cane, Miguel, other places. Uh, I don't have time to go over the literature in full detail, but it includes travelers, journals, missionaries, archaeologists, anthropologists. It links to actual court cases over jurisdiction, Indian jurisdiction and land claims that threat from the 1590s through the 1690s through to the last claim over land in Cuba, which was decided by the Audiencia of Camagüey, colonial Audiencia against the Indian complaints and against the community of El Cane, in 1849. Fully 300 years after the declared extinction, we have a court case in which a court has to decide against a, an Indian community by claiming that they cannot claim Indianness because they're no longer pure blood. In fact, the community is not accepting this dictum, but in fact comes back with genealogies, court genealogies that prove the full bloodedness of uh, the core of the families there. The court still rules against them. And uh, that was the last Indian jurisdiction uh, within Cuba, the last land claim, that we can say, found its way into the court, 1849. So here we have a sequence of photographs by archaeologist Mark Harrington, who was in the region in 1915, 1919. He's the one that brought out those human remains that we repatriated uh, in uh, 2003, and took some photographs of people in the region. He, uh, he writes, uh, after illustrating you know, his own witnesses of many people he called obvious Indians, it is not so rare to meet Indians here. Harrington wrote in his 1921 book, Cuba Before Columbus. And here we see a, a bit of continuity of mestizaje. The veteran Spanish soldier from the Independence War marrying into an Indian family in Baracoa. A fascinating piece of Cuban history is that a, an Indian <coughs> regiment composed of the Flores Ramirez clan people actually fought, as I mentioned earlier, under Antonio Maceo. This is very interesting because this comes out out of their oral testimonies with us that, oh, we had uh, several grandfathers who fought with Maceo, they fought in the, in the War of uh, Independence, uh, they had some kind of a grouping or a regiment, and so we took that uh, as historians and went to Havana where we had the help of uh, our uh, next speaker here, was Antonio Garcia Molina, and we're able to find the records of the Atuay Regiment as one of the regiments that followed on Maceo, full of Ramirez and Rojas, and other Indian identifiable names like Reyes, Romero, Ramirez again, again. So you have uh, a oral testimony that leads us to a piece of documentary history in Havana that uh, uh, proves this uh, very, very interesting piece of Cuban history. In uh, the mid, uh, okay, I'll go past here. Just a little bit of a documentary record because people say it doesn't exist, but here you have in 1949 an article in the popular Cuban magazine by Antonio Nunez Jimenez, always with the last Indians of Cuba. So you know that trope of I'm the last uh, scientist that's going to see these people before they disappear. But you know, this was in the 1940s, uh, 46, and uh, over 50 years later, it's still there. Very interesting case, uh, speaking of land claims, 1849, a legal land claim. In uh, the same trip, he reports a serious problem with the naturales, the Indians of the Caserio, the famous majority, uh, uh, who thought they were demarcating and measuring land and came out to kick them out. So you have a case of an Indian group led by what they call the captain, uh, the captain Celestino Rojas, coming out and claiming and trying to kick out Nunez Jimenez from their mountains. Very interesting, this has happened in the 40s. So, uh, the, um, go ahead. Uh, the uh, revolutionary government in Cuba, because the, a lot of the fight, uh, Castro's revolutionary fight was in those mountains and a lot of Taino Guajiros joined the fighting rebel army at that time. In 64, 65, there had been enough commotion about this reality that 
they uh, sent a delegation or an excursion out into the mountains to find out what was going on. And this is the memorandum that the group brought back. Uh, don't ask me how, but I have the original of uh, this uh, memorandum in our archives, we'll probably go into the exhibition. So, uh, after that, they sent uh, Rivero de la Calle and Lacalle Murra to, to the region. They did a lot of studies, uh, physical anthropology, a lot of measurements. Some articles began to come out in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, again, physical anthropology, a lot of measurement of noses, of teeth, of uh, ears, uh, the eyes, uh, and so forth. Literally, no questions. There was no ethnographic work, no ethnological work done. And so, you have again, an epitaph of the Americans of Cuba with the fact that science is just beginning to develop the tools of how to really look at this kind of continuity of indigeneity. The scientists that went there in the turn of the century, and even to, unfortunately, a man that I respect a lot, Rivero de la Calle, did not have the tools for how to look at a people once there were other influences within them. So they, they didn't have, if they didn't see loincloths, if they didn't see feathers, and people jumping around in the wild, if they didn't see wild Indians, they moved on. So oh, these are sort of Indian descendants, but if you take the time, sit with folks, and of course if you gain their confidence and you do a, uh, what we call, at least I call uh, the, the, the methodology of compenetration as a scientist, you know, compenetration. You, know, you have to allow the penetration of yourself as well, as well as the people. Once you establish that kind of relationship, that's when the treasures begin to emerge. That's when people begin to share who they are, and in your consciousness, of course, the idea is, is this is not extracted research. This is research that reflects the values and the traditions and the knowledge of that community back to itself. Um, it has been a privilege, really, to document some of the uh, history and oral narrative of this particular clan of Indian descendants, the Rojas Ramirez Indians of the South of Aracoa Mountains of Montana province. We estimate this about four mountains in Montana, but we estimate this gents as some 300 or more related families, perhaps as many as 2,000 people, 1,800s uh, for a recent count, mostly again in the Montana mountains, but now in the diaspora region, as far as Camaway, Matanza, Savannah, and even one family in Flint, Michigan. What they're doing now, which they didn't do before, is that they are reapplying now as consciousness who they are. So now, because of the new technologies and the younger generation beginning to gain uh, more uh, communications uh, mechanisms, you have these people who have been scattered, who normally would disappear by being scattered. Now they have the consciousness of keeping in touch. And so that has generated now a whole new element for these 1,800 to 2,000 people, 300 some families, some that have moved on are reconnecting as they never really lost touch with each other. They just don't have the resources to travel very much, so they kind of forget a little bit who, uh, uh, where they are. But now they have regrouped in a network, and the young people in the community are very excited about this. So you have something that goes again from just survival, survival to what we like to term in this museum, survivors the new science of survival. Uh, survival, but the volition to survive. Not just survival because of remoteness, the volition to survive. The past 15 years have brought a higher visibility and protagonism to the Cuban Indian community. It is encouraging to see and to foretell survival rather than extinction for Cuban Indian people. Thank you.